one of my favorite songs of all time, and this is going to tell you my age, by the way, is Lawrence of Arabia. Now, there's an amazing scene in Lawrence where Gassim, one of his men, gets lost in the, in the Nefut desert. Now, Lawrence, being Lawrence, wants to go and pick him up, bring him back, and Sharif Ali, his lieutenant, tells him, listen, you're never going to find him alive. He's dead. And his death is maktub, is fate, is written. Lawrence, of course, disregards, and in the next scene, he appears carrying the poor Gassim, alive, battered by a life. And Sheriff Ali says, for some people, nothing is written unless they write it. And I love that quote, because even though it's a quote said by a Muslim to a Christian, it's a very Jewish quote. Because Jews, we don't believe in fate. We don't think that there's something that's going to happen to you regardless of how you act. We think that fate is what happens to you unless you act. And this week, I'm learning to love that quote even more. Because Israel at 70 is a story of people defying fate, of people being told is impossible and doing it nevertheless, of people writing their own story. At this very stage, a few years ago, Shimon Peres said that the biggest gift that the, that the Jewish people gave to humanity was dissatisfaction. Jews are the people that not accept the status quo. From Abraham to Moses, from Einstein to Ben-Gurion, we are here to change the world. And this rejection of faith is at the core of philanthropy. Because we don't just say, well, you know, the poor are just fated to be poor. Or we are fated to suffer anti-Semitism. We, we reject it. We do philanthropy because we think we can change things. We can change people's lives and we can change the world. This country is full of examples of how philanthropy can change reality. Now, if through bold philanthropic visions, countries can change their fate, the same is true for individuals. People can alter what appears to be an inescapable destiny through the philanthropy of others. You know, I wasn't fated. My fate wasn't to be here with you today. My fate probably was to live in squalor in some poor Buenos Aires shanty town. If I am here today and I didn't die like my grandfather at 39 or my father at 47 because of the conditions in which they live, it's because of mainly two things. An eshet chayil of a mother who refused to surrender to our fate and a community that had a bold vision and an inimaginable dream that no Jewish kid in Argentina was going to be left to his or her fate. I am here today because of people that did not accept fate as a given. And because of who I am, and because of knowing what philanthropy can achieve for people, for individuals, and for country, it drives me meshuga when philanthropy does not maximize its potential. And I'm not alone. Lately, there seems to be a sort of malaise around philanthropy. A lot of folks have great ideas and bold visions, but at the same time, they doubt whether philanthropy can really produce change. They believe that the problems of the world have become too difficult, too intractable for philanthropy to have an impact. And that's understandable. After billions of dollars that we pour into philanthropy, many of the world problems remain unchanged. In a recent survey, the Center for uh, Effective Philanthropy discovered that only 13% of CEOs of major foundations in the United States think that philanthropy collectively is changing society. 
Think about it. 87% of funders think that philanthropy is falling short of its potential. And you know, to a certain extent, one can understand them, because if we were so good in our philanthropy, the world would look very different than it is today. We wouldn't have war, we wouldn't have uh, hunger, we would have cured cancer, uh, Alzheimer, hemorrhoids, whatever. It would be a very different world. But being an optimist against my better judgment, I would rather approach this reality not by focusing on those that don't change the world, but focusing on the philanthropies that do change reality, that do change the world. And many of you are here. Those funders manage to change reality, and they don't have to be big funders investing millions. They can also be small funders that have a creative idea that then is pilot and get replicated and scaled higher. Now, what do these funders have in common? What do the funders that really move the needle have in common? What's their secret sauce? What, what differentiates a bold vision that remains just a dream from a bold vision that becomes a reality? Many things. But one stands out above all of them. All these funders reject simple answers and embrace complexity. It's becoming a truism already that the world has become terribly complex. You know, think about, thinking about the complexity of the world, I feel like that guy in the deck of the Titanic who was drinking a whiskey and said, I know I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous. So, how, how nice it would be if the world was all neat and simple, if every problem had a clear solution, if all the chips fell into place all the time. Well, in case you haven't noticed, it is not. So when facing complexity, we have two options. We can ignore it, we can run away, or we can understand that there is no other way than wrestling with the complexity of the world. The fear of complexity always leads us to magical thinking. What's happening in politics is that because people cannot cope with the complexity of the world, they go to simple answers, to populist answers that promise them an easy answer to issues that can never have an easy answer. As a global network celebrating 70 years of the State of Israel, no issue illustrates better that complexity than the relation between Israel and the Jewish world. Now, there can never be an easy solution for that because there is no precedent in the world for a people dispersed and exiled for 2,000 years coming together to create, to create a state that is not only a state of all its citizens, but also a state of a dispersed people. How can it be an easy solution for something that is a new experiment in the history of humanity? Now, embracing complexity promises a hard life of permanent, of permanent wrestling and adjusting and forcing you to be flexible, but ignoring complexity will end either in irrelevance or in catastrophe. Our tradition, the Jewish tradition, teaches us to live in that tension, to embrace that complexity, to wrestle with that complexity day in and day out. And that's maybe what we're called Israel, the one who wrestles. So all of us have different missions and different interests. So we face different complexities. But there are things that we can do to live with that complexity. And I want to suggest five things that we can do to embrace complexity better. First, in the Jewish and Israeli context, embracing complexity means accepting the basic diversity of the Jewish people. Many of us, too many of us, would prefer a Jewish world that only have people that are like me, that think like me, that look like me. 
You know, the Orthodox, some in the Orthodox world, some in the right say, well, the liberal Jews don't count because they're all assimilated and they're disengaged anyway. Some in the liberal camp say, well, the Orthodox don't count. They are a relic from ancient times. Sooner or later, they're going to disappear. Well, you know what? I have news for them. Nobody is disappearing. We are stuck with one another. And it's good that we're stuck with one another. Because those that don't understand the essential complexity and diversity of the Jewish people don't realize that we are like a mosaic, that it's only beautiful when it has different pieces of different colors, or like a diamond that is more valuable the more facets we have. I'm sure you know the joke of the Jewish Robinson Crusoe. You know, right? He, they come to rescue him, a Jewish Robinson Crusoe stranded in an island. They come to rescue him, and he shows very proud all the things that he built alone in the island. He says, this is my house, this is my workshop. That building there, that's my synagogue. And the rescuer asks, and that building over there? Oh, that's another synagogue, but I would never set foot on that one. Now, traditionally, this joke is interpreted as, uh, as a demonstration of how fractious and how divided the Jewish people is. But for me, it's the opposite. Think about it. Even though he would never go to that synagogue, it was important for him that he was there. My friends, we Jewish funders work with these Jewish people with this Israeli society, with the real one, not with the one that the prophets of exclusion keep imagining. So we need to embrace that diversity and that complexity because diversity is a guarantee of creativity and the best antidote we have against entropy. Second, <laughs> being effective in complex times demands that we become relentless question askers. And that's not easy, because our society values those that have the strong answers. Those that they seem always to be infallible and know what there is to do, even though they are consistently wrong. But that doesn't matter, because we live in what neurologist Thomas Barton called a certainty epidemic. Everybody is certain of what they know. You know, children ask questions. Adults don't. They are conditioned to know that it is not good to ask questions, it's good to have all the answers. We value the strong leader who has all the answers. Let me tell you something. A leader who has all the answers is a strong leader in the same way that cyanide is a strong drink. <laughs> to, be, to be truly strong leader in these complex times, the most important skill a funder can have is to ask questions to ask questions and challenge the status quo, and that force us to look at things in a different way. Y you all know what deja vu is, right? You, look, you go to a place that you've never seen before, and it sounds, odd, it looks to you oddly familiar. Well, I want to propose that we do something different. We do the inverse, the vujade. In other words, take something that is very familiar and look at it anew. That's a way of questioning your reality. When was the last time that you put a question mark after your most strongly held belief? Believe me, it's a terrifying exercise, but it's so necessary in times like this. What ruins the world is not too much criticism, but the absence of self-criticism. Those who never change their mind never change anything. The third point I want to make and you know me, I repeat this over and over and over. In complex situations, to be effective, we have to collaborate. collaborate collaboration, partnership, networking is not anymore a nice to have. It's a basic necessity. You know the joke of the, of the factory owner whose uh, production line, line breaks and he's losing millions of dollars every day, so he goes and looks for the world expert in that type of machine, the guy comes and in a nonchalant way, takes a screwdriver, turns a screw, and tells him, voila, it works, you owe me $100,000. And the guy tells him, $100,000 for turning a screw? No, 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 
Turning a screw is one dollar. Knowing which screw to turn is 99,000. So we are a little bit like this industrialist. Sometimes we keep turning the wrong screw. And in very complex times, we need to make sure that different members of the ecosystem, different parts of the system are turning different screws, which are the programs, which are the ways in which we can affect reality. The more screws we turn, the more impact we are going to have. And collaboration is not only funding together, although that's fine. It's not you fund my project, I fund you. We can do a lot of that. But the type of collaboration I'm referring, you I'm, uh, referring to you now is when we sit together with a very difficult problem and we, pay, and we put our brains together towards solving this problem. At this very time, as we speak, there is a group of funders that have gone together to tackle a very complex problem, the issue of Me Too and the status of women in the Jewish community. And they deserve a lot of credit because they're facing this issue without answers. They don't know what works and what doesn't. They just sit together and wrestle with a very difficult issue. The fourth key to being effective in very complex time is to be in it for the long haul. In the Jewish world, sometimes we are infanticides. We fund the projects, and when it's taking off, we shut it down. We lose interest too fast. Any program that made a difference was funded and supported for a long, long time. Avi was speaking this morning about his program for road safety. What, 22 years, Avi? 22 years. Birthright, 18 years. JTFN, you just saw, 11 years. There, is, there are no shortcuts, but a long, sustained commitment to, to investing in a problem and investing in the level that the problem requires. Philanthropy is like climbing a mountain. You don't see that the landscape is beautiful unless you reach the top. And, it will, it, and it's going to take you a long time to reach the top. It is rewarding, but it's going to take you time. Fifth and final, those who are successful at navigating complexity are those who have a clear and inspiring vision. Now, you think that's obvious. Of course, we have to, fa to have a vision. But sometimes I feel that all the things we're trying to do in Jewish philanthropy is to stop things. We want to stop assimilation. We want to stop anti-Semitism. I don't think that being a red traffic light is anybody's idea of an inspiring dream. Do we as funders have enough bold visions? Are we willing to make bold bets? Do we have enough dreams? Do we have enough philanthropic moonshots? But it, you know what? Let me correct myself. The moonshot is not a good analogy because President Kennedy made this moonshot, the, the drive to get to the moon, out of fear that the Soviets were going to overtake America in the space race. I would like to see moonshots, bold dreams, bold bets out of optimism and out of a knowledge of the amazing things that we can do when we work together. Sadly, in today's world, only the most extreme seem to have passion and the willingness to carry out their dream. It is our duty to show them that one can be passionate in moderation. The word passion in English comes from pathos, to suffer. But in Hebrew, it lahavut comes from lehava, flame. And fire and passion have something in common. You can give it to somebody else without you losing it. So never let the extremist, the monopoly over passion. Never think that bold vision and embracing complexity are contradictory. They are not. Clear visions and executions are actually two sides of the same coin because Execution without a vision is a nightmare, and a vision without execution is hallucination. So, diversity, curiosity, collaboration, patience, and vision. That's how Jewish funders 
can rewrite fate and change the world. And for JFN, the core of our mission is to help you do precisely that. We are not just a trade union of funders. We're, just, we're not just a place where funders come to schmooze. We are here to help you realize your philanthropic dreams. That's why over the last year, we've been working in a new, in a new strategic framework that we call JFN 3.0. It's not particularly original, the name, but the thinking behind it is, is the notion that we are going to be here helping you form coalitions and movements to address major issues in the Jewish world. In other words, we want to transform networked philanthropy into a force for good in the world. We ask three basic questions that are questions that every organization needs to ask itself. Why, what if, and how? Why is philanthropy not maximizing its potential? What if we could help funders work together and collaborate more? And how we do it? How do we make this vision a reality? You see, in the Bible, when God approaches Moses to lead the Jewish people, Moses panics. He has a very human reaction. He says, Mi anochi, who am I? Who am I to lead? In our world, we are called to lead. There is a dearth of leadership in the world. And when we are called to lead, many of us may panic too and may say, Mi anochi, who am I? But Ultimately, we all need to step up because the Jewish world is hungry for positive, transformative leadership and they are looking to us. It falls on each and every one of us to do whatever we can to lead the Jewish people and the world to a much better place. It reminds me of that story of the man who sits in front of God and you know, complains to him, Look at God, look at all the suffering, the anguish, the distress in the world. Why don't you send help? And he says, I did send help. I sent you. Earlier, I said that we're called Israel, the one who wrestles. But we're also called Yehuda, which means the one who gives thanks. In fact, in philanthropy, Israel and Yehuda, courage, and gratitude are inseparable. We do philanthropy because we want to change the world and we have the courage to wrestle with complex issues, but we also do philanthropy out of profound gratitude. Gratitude for what we have, gratitude for all the blessings that were bestowed upon us without necessarily us deserving it. Gratitude for the amazing miracle that is this country all around us. Gratitude to the men and women that fertilized this ancient soil with their sweat, their tears, and their blood. Gratitude to every generation of the Jewish people that wrote their chapter in the collective Jewish adventure and kept the Jewish people alive through insurmountable odds. Gratitude to each and every one of the miracles that we are blessed with. My friends, I've been saying how complex and difficult our times are, but let's never forget that as hard and difficult our challenges appear, they are not even close to being as hard and as the ones that our ancestors had to face. Yes, the world is bedeviled by complexity. These are the times, said Thomas Paine, that try men's soul, and many of us may use the complexity as an excuse for inaction and despair, but we don't have that luxury. We are guided by what Hillel said 2,000 years ago, where, there's, where there are not good people, you be a good person. In this room today, I see almost 600 truly good people. Looking at you, a quote comes to mind. It says, Ashrei a'am sheka halo. Happy is the people that have folks like you. You could be anywhere today, and I'm sure you have a million things to do that are more fun 
to listen to some hyper verbose dude with a funny accent. But you're here. And the fact that you're here gives me enormous hope. I pledge to you, and I ask you to pledge to each other, that we will never be afraid of complexity and will never shrink from tackling it for, for taking it on. And with courage and gratitude, together, we will keep writing the fate of our people and of the world. And I want to leave you with a short story, as I always do. It's a, fab it's a midrashic fable of the creation. The, you know, God creates the birds, but the birds are very clumsy. They move slow, so everybody eats those poor birds. So the birds complain to God. They say, you know, you have to do something. We, we're very weak, we're very slow, we're very we're heavy, we're clumsy. So God gives them wings. But the problem is that now they're heavier and bulkier and clumsier. So they are being eaten even more. So they complain to God and God tells them, well, I gave you wings, but now you have to learn how to fly. We've been given amazing blessings. We've been given wings. Let's learn to fly together. Thank you.